Welcome back to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, where you'll find information on what's going on on the North Fork of Long Island. We'll be focusing on issues and opportunities going on in the community, as well as people and stories from the present and the past. I'm your host, Christopher Bianchi, and for episode 37, our guest today is Reiner Gross, and we talked to him about his time growing up in Germany and going to art school and how he made his way over to New York City in the 70s and some of the other things throughout his career as an artist and eventually making his way to Greenport. So I hope you enjoy episode 37 with Reiner Gross. This episode was recorded March 19th, 2024. Thank you so much for coming on to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast today. Thank you, Chris, for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to be part of this. Thank you. So I, I'd like to start off with just an introduction where you were born and raised. Well, I was born and raised in Germany, in Cologne, Germany, born in 1951, and grew up uh, sort of in a suburb of Cologne. Cologne was at the time being rebuilt after World War II, and there was still a lot of uh, rebuilding and all kinds of things going on that had to do with reconstruction. Mm. And uh, we were quite... uh, Fortunate to be in the suburbs, it was, you know, less destroyed than Mm. the main city at the time. And it was still the early 50s where things were on the up and up, as they say. Yes. And with your parents, could you, how far back does your family go in Cologne? Well, I think everybody came out of the area around Cologne. My uh, grandparents were living uh, just slightly outside the city and their parents were mostly had been farmers a little further out and during sort of the industrial revolution there people moved towards the cities and my grandmother worked in you know in the World War One she worked in an ammunition factory as a 15 year old and both of my grandfathers worked at a steel company there and that made uh, wires for uh, underground uh, electrical and uh, phone lines under the sea. It was a mm. company that was you know, in Cologne itself and they would commute by bicycle. Yes. And th- did they ever talk about, there was a kind of a economic collapse in the tw- i think it was in the 1949 or the 1929 in the, er- you in the early i mean the late 20s yeah the 1929 that was very impactful which devastated german economy and uh, made the parliament uh, not working correctly and that led to a uh, fascist takeover by mm-hmm. by hitler because the parties couldn't that new democracy that was installed after uh, 1918, after First World War ended, uh, was relatively new and uh, a lot of different parties, and it was dysfunctional, not unlike what's happening in this country right now. You can see some similarities. Oh, yeah, there are definitely <laughs> similarities, and Americans have never experienced. Uh, a fascist takeover and uh, it's the most dangerous uh, terrible thing that could happen to a country. And what about your parents? Did both of your parents grow up in Cologne? They grew up in Cologne. My mother was born in 1929 so she was a teenager when uh, World War II happened and uh, my dad was also born in I think 28 and he was drafted by the uh, Nazis when he was 15 and sent to the Western Front with a rifle. Wow. And uh, he was lucky, you know, he just survived and uh, survived the the invasion. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
the funny story is he he knew how to play the accordion and the the british who captured him f found out that he could play the accordion so they took him out of the prison of war camp gave him an accordion and he played for the officers so he got a better ration <laughs> and uh they gave him all those american tunes like chattanooga choo choo and all that kind of yeah. music from the 40s that he yeah. then learned and played for dances after the war with another uncle of mine in wow. local, local bars <laughs> <laughs> so that's where he met my mother she was just coming for a dance with a girlfriend <laughs> oh <laughs> and how was it for him after the war coming back they missed education they missed the schooling uh, my dad uh, went to evenings classes he became an engineer in that same factory where my grandparents worked mm -hmm. and um, uh, they were all uh, there for, for I mean my grandparents worked there for 40 50 years and my dad 25 30 years afterwards when I grew up and did he ever or did your parents ever say anything about because I think was it like 95 percent of the the, ta the city was yeah the city was about 90 percent bombed out and, and and they bombed around there's a big cathedral in Cologne, a Gothic cathedral from the 12th century, which is one of the major, it's a UNESCO monument, and it's, it's, a, it's huge. Mm -hmm. And they used that as navigation mm. for all the bombing raids. So that actually stayed intact, but everything else around it was just decimated. That was just a point of, like a landmark that they could... Yeah, right. They, they didn't have GPS in those days. <laughs> And that was one of the tallest yeah, cathedrals it's, it's, in Europe. It's, yeah. it's a major. Yeah. And then coming to you, you were born in Cologne. And did you have any siblings? I have no siblings. No siblings. I was uh, only, only child. child. Yes. And you were more in the suburbs. I was in the suburbs. Occasionally, we would, we would go into town. To do some shopping, to do something, and to mm -hmm. to visit some other family members who had moved into town. And as a kid, uh, I was always excited to go to the so-called big city at the time and <laughs> see what was going on. And we we started. There were new museums. There was all kinds of cultural things that were going on in my teens. And I in my teens, I spent more time in town. I was an extra at the theater, the local theater. I became interested in the arts through school. And how was school for you, kind of growing up? School was a, was for me personally. It was um, a bit of a struggle because my father was an engineer, and he sent me to a gymnasium, which was like the higher education that was math and physics oriented and it wasn't quite my thing but uh, I managed to get through it <laughs> or I don't know if they still have that in Germany but it's more you pick a path early on right and you, you go that after way. fifth grade you are, you can take either you take in a you stay in the regular public high school or you go to a specialized school and you take a test mm -hmm. so I took a test after fifth grade and got into the so-called higher education and that is leads you to stay there till you're about 20 mm. and it's another nine years and uh, that was a school that was had philosophy it had uh, music arts uh, math science all kinds of you know literature so you, you get a better education mm. right? and then from there you go straight to university but you well, needed okay. that abitur which is sort of the degree to go to university but you didn't get to do any arts. I was always paint. I was painting. I was since I was an only kid. I had. I didn't. I spent a lot of time alone painting and drawing, and then uh, outside of school. Outside of school, yeah, yeah, and uh, that was. I was kind of a loner, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, then. Also played some music in the 60s, the 1960s, with local bands and stuff. That was lots of fun. And could you describe a little bit the neighborhood or community you grew up in? Well, it, it was a lot of people either worked at different factories where I grew up. There was the Bayer Aspirin factory, the huge Bayer company. They made all kinds of uh, medications. And then there was Felton Guillaume, which was the steel 
business and there was a big Ford Motor Company also in Cologne and a lot of people would commute from those suburbs to those different workplaces. It was a working class community, I would mm-hmm. say. And did your parents have any other stories about Cologne or what you might do on the weekend? Uh, well, we, we would, my father was involved in uh, in some local activities he was something he he was a free thinker and he was a follower of bertrand russell and there was a whole community of youth movements that took care of kids who were not in religious schools and he was part of that and i would follow along and go to as a kid run around on weekends and do walks and go in the forest and do stuff like that and and uh you know it was was uh, an, an alternative kind of use program and you said that he did some education after the war yes he went to evening school for to get his certificate as an engineer and then he became a technical part of a technical director team at this company that designed uh, uh, high voltage stations mm. for, for electrical use. And then did you say what your mom did? Well, my mom, when I was five, six years old, she she opened a store uh, across the street from where I went to school and started selling school equipment. Oh, wow. And uh, she was grew up uh, working in a grocery store when before she got married, and then uh, she, but she was kind of restless and she wanted to do something, so she started a little store with, and then she wanted to be close to me at the same time. She also wanted to do something, so, <laughs> and that that sort of led to to that, which she actually then grew, and um, you know, she did it for another twenty five years, mm. and. Were you also interested in cinema early on? Uh, yeah, I used to go to the movies. God, we had, uh, I was a kid, I, an uncle or my dad would give me a couple of coins and every Sunday there was a movie theater and we would watch American films, like old John Wayne cowboy movies. and, and st- yeah. But the nice thing is the anticipation, you had to wait to see it. You know, yes. it was always at three o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, you don't not, get that today. No, <laughs> there was something sort of magical about having to wait. Yeah, and uh, we did then in the late fifties. We got television in Germany, one channel, and uh, we we started off with a lot of American shows in those days. They weren't. Were they showing the early German silent expressionists? No, they weren't (laughs) showing anything like that. They were showing some children's programs from 5 to 6.30. Then at 8 o'clock was the news. And then there was some major feature afterwards. And and then on Saturdays, they would have, let's say, Bonanza or Flipper or some in the 60s. You know, know, shows like that. Yeah. And also, do you have any, remember any traditions that, your family did uh, for even for the holidays. Or... Oh yeah, we had Easter and we had Christmas and and all that. So yeah. that was always. And then uh, then we had June seventeenth. There was always because Germany was split into two with the Russian part and that, and there was always this uh, the remembrance of uh, June seventeenth when we had to light candles for our suffering brothers in the east and that was a big holiday in those days and then i remember you know the wall being built and and all those uh you know difficulties that germany had to go through and then coming out of i guess it wasn't wouldn't be called high school higher education yeah it was called a gymnasium gymnasium which which is uh, means a different thing here but the gymnasium is something else but (laughs) <laughs> yeah. But it was a gymnasium for the brain as well. Yeah. Did you know what you wanted to do coming I, out? Yeah, I knew that I did not want a regular job. I didn't want to be employed somewhere. 
even though I after I got out of school, I worked for six weeks at Bayer, at, at yeah at the Bayer company, as a sort of a student intern, and I you know, had to punch the clock at six thirty in the morning, and so I did that for six weeks, and um, it was a great experience, uh, and we made a little money over the summer after school, and then I we took that money and some friends of mine who were in a similar position. Uh, one of his family had a VW bus and we took the VW bus and drove from Cologne to Istanbul and further oh. south you know, <laughs> for, for three, four weeks. And that was just magical for us. Just to kind of get out of just Germany to see and see something else, something else. To, and to do something. You're 20 years old. You want to just, just experiment. Mm-hmm. And, and see what's what else is out there and that was just an adventure and uh, going through communist countries like Bulgaria and Yugoslavia at the time and then entering crazy Turkey with all this kind of music and spirit and it was just you know a great thing to to experience and was that in the 60s that was 1971 and then uh, yeah and then after that I enrolled in art school where did you go to? Well, first I went to Dusseldorf, which was the Academy of Art in Dusseldorf, where an artist named Josef Beuys was teaching, and he was a known as a fluxus artist. Uh, he did a lot of happenings. Uh, he did a lot of political art, and he was a shaman of did performances and, and things like that. And there were some other painting classes that were offered, uh, I enrolled and I was in, accepted in his class, but unfortunately, uh, he accepted everybody else who was not admitted to his class. So he got immediately fired uh, from that position. And he also then ran for a chancellor and direct democracy. He was a wild guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, so then I said, well, I switched to Cologne and enrolled in Cologne in another art school where I met some very new young guys, dear friends that I'm still con- connected with today. So we all hung out and, you know, wanted to make the new art for the new century, you know, which was quite ambitious at the time <laughs> and romantic. What? Well, how long were you at? Uh, the Dusseldorf Academy. I was sit there for two weeks until he got fired and then uh, I said this this was very confusing for me at the time so I went also closer to my home because I did I was still living at home and was commuting oh uh-huh. so Cologne seemed like more of a logical place at the time and uh, and yeah. I I felt more at home there there was wonderful painting classes and sociology they had had all kinds of other things there that I really was interesting life drawing color theory and all that stuff and and there were a couple of bars around the corner which was where we mostly hung out (laughs) hung out and discussed yeah art politics politics whatever uh, we were interested in social issues and and it was Mm -hmm. was and we drank (laughs) but was like overall it was a good experience at Cologne yeah it was a great great experience and I met uh, lifelong friends uh, that I'm still in contact with you know Mm -hmm. do you have or if you had any I guess teachers that were inspirational to you yeah there was um, there were several teachers that were First of all, in my gymnasium, there was a guy named Manfred Gaul, who was uh, Dr. Gaul. He was a very literate person. He uh, he was also an artist. He taught he taught German and and uh, he taught taught uh, literature and philosophy. And he also was a practicing artist, made sculptures, and we became lifelong friends. I saw him till a few years ago when he died in his nineties. And I used to go visit him when I was in, in Cologne. And we had a long, long uh, friendship after school. And uh, uh, that was one of my main teachers that I really got along with. You know? mm. And were you focused more on painting? I or was, you were still figuring out? 
I was uh, always fascinated by putting paint on canvas. And I got, I was fascinated by looking at paintings and how they were done and, and how I couldn't understand them and how it would work. And the idea of, of conceptualizing something in a, in a rectangle or a square format and limiting yourself to that sort of meant always a lot to me and I, that's, and I loved to look mm -hmm. at, I loved looking at paints we had some wonderful museums in Cologne that were uh, we had a lot of medieval art and that was hidden during the war they took it all and take took it out of town put it in vaults so they wouldn't have been destroyed mm. and um, a lot of the pre-war contemporary art which was very expressionistic was not around anymore because it had been confiscated by the Nazis and sold off in Switzerland, uh, most of it, a lot of it. And um, it was, during the war, considered degenerate art, which is... But we were... And after the war, there was a revival of all that. Uh, mm -hmm. All that was brought back and, and, and to the consciousness of artists and and... The other thing is artists had to find a new beginning after World War II. I mean, there was a mm -hmm. whole new emphasis on we have to start fresh here. Mm. Even new museums and uh, art foundations were art exhibition spaces, Kunsthals started, to, but they wanted to show, they wanted to start fresh. Mm. So it was an exciting time and there was a lot of stuff that happened outside the regular channels like happenings and f and performance art and uh, uh, yeah it was a good good time in Cologne. Was I thought I remember was there a new Cologne like art fair that started? Yeah, in '68 the, there 68. was the first art fair started by a guy named Zwirner, Rudolf Zwirner, who is the father of this gallery Zwirner now. Mm. And he started to had he had one of the most uh, interesting galleries in Cologne in the 1960s. Showed a lot of uh, international art, and uh, uh, as a teenager, I would go see all this work. Mm. And there was a big collector named Ludwig, who collected a lot of pop art, mm. and he came and bought a lot of stuff from Leo Castelli in those days and the galleries in New York. A big Jasper Johns piece of. The world map, it's the largest piece Jasper Johns ever did. It's in Cologne in the museum. Mm. And so, so I was exposed to a lot of international, especially American art. Early on. Early on, yeah. Yeah. Would you say in school at that time, because you said Germany was starting fresh and some of the newer art ways, the ways of thinking, were they even say like Joseph or Joseph boys, boys um, doing more conceptual and more theory-based work and not just the kind of the the German expressionists, what you think earlier on. Were they going more on that conceptual, or were the teachers pushing that earlier on, or were they just teaching you more how to do more the technical side? The technical side wasn't really taught that well anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, because no one knew how to do it. Mm. And uh, so you were basically left with theoretical instructions. And we had some painters uh, that were teaching, that were doing their paints, and you could see what they were doing. And they, well, they told you a little bit about how to mix oil with you know, paint or something, but it wasn't really that much taught. You had to figure it out. And uh, then we had to critique every... Once a week, every I had to bring something in, and, and mm -hmm. you sit around in a circle with other students and some teachers, and so it it got kind of uh, after about eight months, I, I got kind of tired of it. To tell you the truth, I mean, I think it's still taken on I like that today, a little bit. The teaching style is somewhat like okay, you just do. I'm not going to show you too much, or at least from my experience in art school but yeah unless you're going to a specific school that's like really trained more maybe well it's a trade school it, and that's what's not to, to us at that time it's of too, no interest we didn't want to learn a trade we wanted to learn how to express ourselves 
And then you said you met a lot of people. Uh, did you meet a, a lot of American artists? Well, well, yeah. I met a lot of artists from the community because there were exhibitions and uh, a lot of gatherings and there were certain bars everybody would go. And, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you didn't have cell phones. You just, you knew sh people would show up, you know, <laughs> and you get to be able to talk to other artists or older artists. And... Um, and it was an interesting time, you know. And uh, I did meet uh, one, the reason I'm basically in America is because I met someone from New York uh, who was in a big show called Documenta, which is held every four years in the German town of Kassel. And he was setting up a studio for a while in Cologne. He had gallery shows uh, as well in Europe. And he was looking for a student to help him because he didn't speak any German. And so he came to school and said, Is any, can I, you know, you know any student who might be interested in help me out? So I thought, oh, this guy's from America. It's very interesting. So I, I volunteered. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I worked with him for a while and uh, met a lot of American artists through Ooh. him. Could you Oh yeah, I mentioned him? Well, I... I he he we went to this show called documenta and there was a whole group of artists staying at the same hotel i went with him and uh, yeah. there was malcolm morley who was from britain who uh, actually ended up living in bellport uh, right at the end of his life he passed away recently and uh there was lowell nesbitt a realist painter uh, a bunch of other people uh, just chuck close was at, in the show as a young, you know, photorealist, uh, sort of, and they all were hanging out in this the Holiday Inn, so I met mm -hmm. a lot of them. And then Howard invited me to come, uh, Howard Kanowitz, who lived, had a place in Amagansett, invited me to come for the summer to to the U.S. for the first time. Mm. And, and I th is his work more, like, more hyper-realist? It's, yeah, he's a very... He, he started off as a as an abstract expressionist painter in the 1950s and showed with a gallery called the Stable Gallery, which was a renowned gallery in those days, where uh, all the abstract artists would show. And then he, in the early 60s, he started to switch to a representational, conceptual style of, of documenting um, New York life. And there was a big, big painting he did... Uh, um, the New Yorkers, which was in the last uh, Whitney show of, there was a show of figurative painting about two years ago, and he had a big painting in that show, and some of his works are at the Parish and at different museums in Europe mm -hmm. and at the Whitney. And he also had a big show at the Jewish Museum in 1968 or, with his work. And, um, and through him, you know, I met other artists on the on the... On the South Fork at those days, I was hanging out there. So he was playing uh, in a band with, he was playing a trombone with a guy named Larry Rivers who was playing the saxophone. And so I hung out with other painters uh, who were also musicians. And we all, mm. you know, just uh, had a wonderful Somewhat summer. Somewhat of like a nice art. Yeah, it was a good group. But the Kooning was out there, Lane de Kooning, uh, Jack Youngerman who was a painter. Uh, uh, it was a very active scene out there in the summers. And, uh, I'm just curious, when you decided to come over, were you thinking about wanting to... Was New York on your mind, or were you like... Oh, I, it was, I was just curious. I <laughs> said, I, I got a chance to go to America. That wasn't usually in the stars for everybody in those days. <laughs> and, uh, and I'd get an invitation. And uh, so I came, then went back after the summer. Uh, then I get another call later on, do you want to come to New York to my loft and help me there for a while? So he got me an H3 visa something as, a, as an apprentice. So I came uh, in 73. Uh, and then uh, I said, well, I can always go back. I, you know. But yeah. somehow uh, things turned out different. <laughs> <laughs> And how would you describe New York City at that time? Oh, New York City was, uh, it was 
the time the time of where everybody wants to move to the suburbs and you could get a loft inexpensively in Soho or in the East Village and um, I was just living in this guy's Howard's loft and he was living somewhere you know outside the loft and he had a loft on St. Mark's Place and 2nd Avenue and uh, I just uh, got a little lonely after a while because I was by myself and then I got another friend of mine from the art school over here and I got him a gig with Larry Rivers on 14th Street so the two of us would then hang out and go to all kinds of events that were happening you know, music you know art and the city was downtown pretty abandoned there wasn't much going on and and, and Soho was just starting with some galleries very slowly mm -hmm. but uh it was a it was a good time yeah what about your artwork at that time what were you kind of i was working yeah i was absorbing a lot of different influences and it was i didn't know where it was going i thought well if i hang around long enough and i absorb a lot something might come out of it you know and mm -hmm. so i worked for different artists uh as you know assistant and helped prepare work help paint things, learned how what made them tick. Mm. And I uh, just uh, got to see a lot of different art studios and uh, meet a lot of American artists at the time that were uh, living downtown and midtown and uptown and went to Andy's factory and, you know, a lot of clubs, uh, played got another band going in New York in the 70s played mm. CBG we had you know played all the max all these clubs in New York so there was a lot of yeah. activity yeah. even though the city seemed more abandoned yeah there's still for artists it was it was it a was, playground it to, was also inexpensive to live so yes. so the little jobs I had I could make it work you know could mm -hmm. hang around and and absorb and you know it was, was good i mean i had a loft for four hundred dollars a month yeah so it wasn't <laughs> you know yeah that's yeah that's amazing and were you would you still go out to the south fork every yeah, summer i would go out for seven years in a row even in the winters i would to take the train out to larry rivers studio and work with him there and I spent three days out here and I maybe go back, go back and forth. In the summer, uh, he put me up. He had a little extra uh, barn that he put me up in. And then I worked with him in the summer out there. Um, and then uh, I had my first exhibition out in uh, Southampton. There mm -hmm. used to be a place called the Tower Gallery right on Tropes Lane and Main Street. And... Uh, that sort of got me started, you know. And what? How would you describe the, your first exhibition in terms of your artwork? Well, it was a combination of a lot of European influences, like historical Baroque things and modern culture. I would paint, uh, you know, biblical scenes on a television, and I would paint the television and the biblical scenes like. Lot leaving his Sodom, you know, and and through television, through media, and it 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 was a whole series of television paintings I made in those days because mm. I was always filtering images through other media, and I was very fortunate. I got a half page review in the New York Times for my first show. In in, I mean, I, it usually doesn't happen, so no. that got me a little bit started, you know. It's a lot, very fortunate to to be out also among all those other great, wonderful painters that were out there, and I absorbed a lot. Mm. And you were still, I mean, you stayed through the 70s, 80s, 90s. I think, did you ever think about going back to Germany? Well, first, I, I had to wait for a green card. Mm -hmm. I, I, there was four years I couldn't leave. Because, oh. if, because if I left, they would have, wouldn't have let me in, yes. back in. So finally I got a green card, and then um, I went back occasionally. And now um, I'm going back three times a year because I still maintain a studio in Cologne. 
Because okay. I'm work. I have a lot of things I'm involved in in Europe still in different mm. different parts of, of different countries, and so I. Um, and the funny thing is that factory that both of my parents and my my parents, my father and mm -hmm. my grandparents worked in. You know that company went defunct. Someone else, a friend of mine, actually took part of it over. There was all these empty industrial halls where things were manufactured and turned it into uh, different young entrepreneurial companies. There's a coffee roasting company. There's now there's all kinds of stuff in young people sitting around computers doing internet stuff. And, and so I've got a little studio there that I can still work in when I'm in, in Germany. Is it in that? It's in the same factory the I same, used to, wow. where I used to take uh, lunches to the gate to give to my grandfather. You know? Wow. So they, they all started. That's interesting. They all, they all retired at 65 and I just rented a place when I was 65. That was it's, you know, seven years ago. <laughs> they would probably be surprised. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, what it's you're painting in there and I used to do all this. Yeah, and it's, all, it's a different place now. It's yeah. just um, time moves on and things change and... And a friend of mine started uh, that one of the big industrial manufacturing places became a rock and roll uh, space for bands and that can hold two thousand. So he he just got that going, you know. Mm -hmm. And back in New York City, did you see New York kind of changing through the different decades? Oh yeah, there was in the seventies. There was first of all the oil crisis. And then, then they were starting to build a subway on Second Avenue from Housen Street up to Fourteenth Street. That didn't go very far. I and think they were still working on that. It's now they, they closed it up again. You know, yeah. it's like they dug up the whole Second Avenue and then they ran out of money, and then mm -hmm. they just closed it up. And uh, and then the late seventies, it started to pick up again in New York. It, it became much more active. The whole East Village scene started with, with graffiti artists and all that stuff. And I was just right in the middle of all this at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was till till uh, what till about seventy eight. I was still part of a rock and roll band, and I quit that. So at the time, but we were we had a great time in those days. You were doing mu music. I was a drummer mm -hmm. in a punk band. Oh, wow. And we wrote a lot of songs, and because if you played CBGBs, you had to have your own original material, otherwise you couldn't get gigs. And uh, our lead singer was a poet, and uh, we, uh, you know, had our own stuff going. We made a, an EP in England, and uh, we we did, you know, we did quite okay. It was a lot of fun. And did you see any? Were, you said you were still going back and forth to Cologne. Yeah. How would you describe the art scene in Cologne when you would go back? It, it's it, artists. I always found that artists, in a, in some form, is local. Mm -hmm. Even the concepts, conceptually, they're all on a similar plane, but they deal with a lo lot of local issues. And the way Americans deal with their own local thing, like for example, that now everybody's dealing with with gender and. and all kinds of social issues and mm -hmm. uh, or the, the whole racial issue, which is, you know, it doesn't really exist in Germany at this point. But there mm -hmm. are other issues, you know, immigration, millions of immigrants from Syria and uh, Ukraine now. There's a lot of, I mean, the, the issues are different, but the art reflects the social structure of every society in a different way. So, mm -hmm. so in that sense, I get to see both, and I, I just, I like the idea of the, the double identity. You know, I'm now, also, I'm an American citizen. I got a German passport, so I've, I can, you know, it, it's it's a good, good way to, to balance everything. Yeah, see what's going on, and yeah, and. Do you remember with the fall of the, the Berlin Wall, did that open up? Because even Munich might have been more of an artsy, more artsy, but then after the Berlin Wall, a lot of people left and went to Berlin because it was more affordable. 
Yes, definitely. And the art scene developed there. A lot of young people went to Berlin after the wall fell. Uh, West Berlin, before the wall fell, was heavily subsidized by the Allies and by German government as the outpost of the West. There was always this so-called air bridge that was, because you couldn't go through East Germany, you had to fly in for a long time. And there was a lot of interest in keeping that island culturally and financially alive. And after the uh, the wall fell, you know, also there was this, all this wonderful real estate in the east that was completely affordable. No one wanted to live there. It was all run down. And a lot of young people from all over the world started coming in. And uh, New York is, I was just there four weeks ago. It's a very vibrant uh, international place right now. And my daughter, who's 30, lives in Berlin now. And back to New York, you were in New York City and on the South Fork East Village. Did you ever come to the North Fork? I came to the North Fork for the first time in the 80s. And uh, we, my wife and I were driving out and then we had a friend who was renting a little place and looking for someone to rent it. And we rented a place in Southhold for, you know, for the summer for a couple of weeks and we still liked it. And uh, we biked around, there were bikes in the house. And so we, then we would occasionally drive out and and see what's going on. And then later on, we, there was, my wife said, oh, we, let's go back. And then they said, well, we couldn't really, do much so in the winter we rented a little place in in orient in january and february and so we would come out in the middle of the winter <laughs> because it was just magical with the ice boating still going on and out there and and it was quiet and we took walks in the marshlands and and and, and then we you know you get older you say well i'm in new york after a while after being there for 45 years um Maybe it's time to do something different. And we, we found, before the pandemic, eight years ago, we found a house in, right here in Carpenter Street. Wow. So we we uh, jumped on that. And <laughs> then since that, well, we've been out here, and uh, then I found a studio in Kachok where I work. So it's yeah. like the best commute I've ever had. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and has your art practice kind of changed over oh definitely it's it's always uh the color i think the color scheme has changed the conceptual approach has changed i was looking at nature for the first time in a seasonal way i mean new york you you don't see the seasons much (laughs) and here you walk out you see the stars you see little stuff coming out of the ground and now already it's it's it and the light and, and just to, to be here and and see this community year round, how it changes, how it evolves, how it has been evolving over the last eight, nine years since we've been here is, is mm-hmm. quite fascinating. And uh, we made a lot of wonderful new friends out here and social connections and mm-hmm. different different uh, things we can be part of. It's It's really lovely. Yes. And is there anything that you're kind of working on now with your art? And, and do you have any exhibitions coming up? Well, I just did a, an exhibition in, uh, actually closed a few weeks ago. I did an exhibition at the Episcopal Church here on uh, Main Street. Uh, I was talking to Roger Jocelyn, the priest, who started a series of exhibitions at the church in, a, in another room, not in the church, but an adjacent room. And uh, he's quite adventurous with uh, offering different things for the, for the community. He does meditation there, he does square dancing, he does yoga, there. he just gets people involved. And um, he said, you wanted to, he had seen a show of mine in Paris by accident and somehow we met in the yoga class and he said so you say ever think of you could do something here and i said well let me think about it and so i said what can i do that has something to do with this community so i went around and 
did 16 pieces of insights of houses of worship on the North Fork. So I went around, you know, photographing mm -hmm. and digitally working on, on, on pieces. Mm -hmm. And then we did this exhibition of 16 pieces of the North Fork, 16 houses of worship. And that was the last thing I did out here. So, but uh, last year was also busy. There was exhibitions in New York, Paris, Germany, other places, China. <laughs> And the, like the one you did here at the Holy Trinity, that was all photograph. That was digitally manipulated photography. Uh, oh, that okay. I, I doubled up images. I worked. The whole idea of two, two things always interested me. That, you know, one. If you, you should, let's say you put a color down, what does it mean? To me, color always means something in relation to another color. So there's always it's about relationships, mm. and. Uh, nothing is really stands on its own very well i always feel that's it has to be put in context and uh, so i i have my own little way of dealing with that double identity and the doubleness and the duplications of things or cultural layerings of let's say the early paintings of the television and the you know, old Baroque paintings or something. How do you put that together? It's a big question. I just pose them. I don't answer them. And you're not keeping with one specific style. Well, you kind of change because I, I know you did the contact painting. Yes, those are still going, and uh, they are they are basically also double images because they're monoprint paintings. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I'm starting something new with. Uh, with something called Madras, which is basically similar. It's also doubling up things. I do something in one direction, I turn the page, I do the same thing with lines in another direction, all of a sudden it turns into a Madras. So I said, wow, what's happening? So I'm, I'm trying to explore that in a painting fashion. That is uh -huh. my new project. So, But that's just the beginning of this new venture. Yeah. I'm still working on other things as well so okay and I have like two other questions oh, please just kind of through your artist journey and everything you've been doing what do you enjoy about being an artist well enjoyment is a complicated question I know. <laughs> uh, well, I, how do you feel your journey has been over the the years and I've been I've been through a lot of different different emotional roller coasters over the years, but I'm I'm always looking for the next thing, and that keeps me going. And I'm always tr not trying, but I, I seek to have this drive. If I don't do it, I don't feel good. So it's self protection. It's part therapy, part, part investigative search, mm -hmm. and um, and I have to manifest it in in an art in a piece. So it's just I'm wired that way, and I, I can't change it. I don't want to change it. I've made a commitment, uh, you know, sixty years ago that that's what I'm gonna do, and it's it's that's what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. It keeps it keeps me vital, and it keeps me alive, and it keeps me functioning, and. Uh, and you were able to make a, a living out of it. I was fortunate to, to be, sustain my art practice for the last 50 years. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. that's to me is, I mean, you don't get rich doing it, but it's at the same time, I was able to do it. And uh, I feel that is success in itself mm -hmm. to just to be able to keep working. I mean, I'm going to be 73 and I just hope to keep working till I drop. Mm -hmm. And like you said earlier on, that you when you came out of higher education, you went work in the factory. You're like, I don't, I know I don't want to go this route. And now you've been able to do what you you love and be able to express and work in work on new ideas within your artwork. Well. Um I feel I'm also very happy to be in Greenport, which we love. My wife and I love it. We are uh, 
integrated in the community. We like to be involved, and uh, you know, there's lots of changes that are happening in town. And mm -hmm. I congratulate the new mayor, Kevin. Has been great, and there's a lot of uh, new initiatives with the theater. Uh, you know, a few things have to get some more affordable housing would be great, mm -hmm. and if people can actually live on a farm that that where that they work on or have people who who have business here are allowed to have workers live mm -hmm. on their premises would be big help you know and maybe something will get better and hopefully we see the arcade become something <laughs> yes it's kind of a sore point downtown but yeah no i think that those are all good things that i think well, th things that need that are trying to be addressed, and other art things that are coming to the North Fork to look forward to. Yeah, we have we have a couple of galleries now. Jonathan's with the VSOP was trying his best, and uh, you know, right here on Main Street, yes. the collective is trying to do things, and so there's stuff going on. It's active. Lots of music. You know, it's yeah. good. Yes. Well, actually, is there. Is there anything else you'd like to discuss or, or that or anything that we haven't talked about? Uh, I feel I feel we had a nice conversation and I want to thank you for for inviting me and uh, and I I'm, if anybody uh, wants to know more they can always contact me I don't know. <laughs> yes. Oh definitely and th thank you so much for coming in today and it was really nice talking to you and that definitely Go check out. Yeah, if you uh, want to look at my webpage, it's reinergross.com. It's Reiner. R A I N E R G R O S S dot com. See some paintings and some other things. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Well, I hope you enjoyed episode 37 with Reiner Gross. I want to thank you for listening to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast. And we'll see you next time.